Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the C3S uh, Institutional Dialogue with uh, our distinguished member, Mr. L.V. Krishnan. Uh, L.V. Krishnan, sir, is a renowned physicist. He worked in the Atomic Energy Department uh, from 1958. He was also involved most recently in the Kalpakam uh, nuclear plant in testing emergency preparedness. And he retired from the Indira Gandhi CAR as the director of the safety research and health physics programs. So thank you very much, sir, for agreeing to be a part of this. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll move on to my uh, interview topic for today. Today we'll be discussing the climate crisis and sustainable development in India and China. Uh, we'll be taking a technical perspective to this. So for the first question, sir, uh, how will the climate crisis impact India and China in the next few years? Uh, should, we, should we be more worried about domestic uh, pollution or gradual climate change? Which do you think is more relevant to us? Well. Uh, in the past two years, there have been several unusual instances of floods, droughts, wildfires, and storms, leading to questions if this portends the future. Climate studies cannot provide precise predictions. So we won't be able to say what will happen in the next five years fairly precisely. But we know that from the daily weather report, that this is the case with climate or weather prediction. Now, IPCC invariably speaks of the probability of occurrence of strong climate events in a certain time frame. I think the world should therefore be prepared for earlier onsets of the consequence of the continuing rise in carbon emissions. It's difficult to predict anything in five years, but according to IPCC, if global emissions continue without restraint on the present scale, global mean surface temperature could rise by 1.5 degrees centigrade over the pre-industrial levels by the end of this decade itself, with a 50% probability. Remember, by the end of this decade itself, with a 50% probability. So it's half and half. I think we should be prepared for it to happen earlier, knowing that the predictions in climate or weather are not that correct, okay, in terms of their occurrence. It's only based on probability. Now, if there are domestic causes for these events, I think they can be easily identified and call it domestic pollution okay but that is not the case mostly so i think it is difficult for us to predict anything in the next five years but i we should also take it as a precaution that ipcc tells us to be prepared for it i don't think it is related to domestic pollution okay yes sir. Thank you very much, sir. So for the next question, um, I wanted to ask, is it possible to reduce energy consumption in the future, or are our ambitions with regard to this too high? Well, I think it's a very quick, good question, because I believe that energy consumption today in many countries is actually extravagant, OK? Now, let us consider this. Electricity generation in India is now about 1,000 units per year per person. It works out to a total of 1,400 billion units for the country as a whole. It certainly needs to grow. What is it in some other countries? It is fourfold higher in UK. Look at their population in comparison to ours. It's fivefold in China almost the same population. And it's tenfold in US, again, with far less population. It may not grow very much further in these three countries, even in China. Now, 
demand for energy is bound to increase substantially to support India's growth. At the same time, if we use energy more efficiently through effective design and use of materials and gadgets so that we can get longer life for them, encourage repairability in design to extend the life of the gadgets and give up the concept of use and throw, that would help substantially to reduce energy consumption. Also, ability to recycle valuable materials for reuse and enable easier disposal of the residual waste is equally important. The best is now waking up to it, but I think we should be prepared for it early enough. So, I think we have to have increased energy supply available to us, but at the same time, we should also follow the practice of restraining consumption. I'll give you another example. Take the condition of our roads. The total road network in India, including rural urban roads and national and state highways, is over 6 million kilometers in length. I didn't know that before, I was quite surprised that it is next to only to, to that of US, which is slightly longer. Mind you, India's area is only one third of the US area. And yet our road network is almost the same. Now, if only our roads are laid out with due care to offer a smooth ride and long life for the vehicles, the vehicles would use less power and repair also will become infrequent for the vehicles. Now, this is particularly important because if you are going to move to electric vehicles, I don't think we should have indiscriminate use of energy because of the bad condition of the roads. So, it is essentially essential to have energy consumption reduced, but it is possible, right? I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, you pointed out uh, that you know developed countries have polluted so much already historically and are consuming so much more energy than developing countries like uh, India. So to follow that up, I wanted to ask you, who do you feel should bear the cost of climate change? In that, how can developed countries and the global rich improve uh, mitigation strategies? And what is the role of the carbon budget in determining this? Well, this is a question that is rather intractable to answer because and just a second. Protracted discussions on funds from developed countries have been initiated quite some time ago and they continue to be discussed in various fora even now. And these developed countries have been and continue to be high GHG emitters, greenhouse gas emitters. I think it is a market that controls the question whether these countries should offer help to the developing nations. It is essentially not the government, but in the market's hands, right? In fact, it is also the influence of the market that at one time said climate change is not happening, right? And then the US did that. In fact, US refused also to sign or uh, confirm their participation in the Kyoto Protocol. So this discussion will go on, but providing training in advanced technologies for those countries, at least those countries that can build on their own, would be a good step. 
this does not really require transfer of funds, but transfer of training and advanced technologies. If this happens, I think at least some of the countries would benefit. There are also a number of other countries that cannot help, that cannot be benefited by this because they don't have any means of uh, production, okay, of uh, energy by the new procedures that are required, nor can they undertake any manufacture. But they would certainly require funds for adaptation. Okay, and a kind of compensation for the kind of damage that their countries suffer. I think at least this that this must be done. I don't know whether this is going to be happening in the near future, but I think this is something that every country must work for, whether they are high emission countries or others. I think the other countries, the non high emitting countries, might actually put more effort into this. That is what we see happening. Let us hope this happens. I think this conference and conference of parties 28 that is going to take place in Egypt would continue discussions on this. Let us hope something will emerge from this. Now you asked a question about carbon budget. I think the idea of IPCC in proposing the carbon budget is essentially to alert the world about the urgency for action to halt and counter the climate change disaster. As I mentioned earlier, in just a decade, we may have the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and the consequences that are predicted to result from that. More and more of these wildfires, floods, stops, things like that, right? So I think in terms of continuing to keep every country on notice that emissions must be brought down as quickly as possible, it is worthwhile. And that is the prime budget of prime from economic prime benefit or prime, uh, let us say, uh, Possible, sorry, uh, let us say the interest of IPCC in proposing this carbon budget. Right? Next. Yes, sir. Thank you a lot for that. Oh, sorry. Were you not finished? So, sorry. Did I interrupt you? Did you have more on this question? you jumped a question maybe that's what you yes sir. i jumped a question because uh, i wanted to follow up based on what you had said i'm planning to get back to okay. that now yeah yeah so um if you could uh, tell me how india and china they made uh, ambitious targets at the paris agreement to reach uh, net zero by 2060 and 2070 so if you could explain um, for someone who doesn't have as much of a technical background, what are the energy pathways that both the countries expect or hope to take to achieve this? Okay. I think we don't have uh, too much of a choice in the pathways. And the pathways are the same for both countries. That is use of solar power, wind, tidal, and nuclear power as non-fossil sources. Besides, uh, some extent of use of fossil fuels is also contemplated, supported by carbon capture use and sequestration technology to limit carbon emission. Batteries and hydrogen are also seen as necessary, but they are only useful energy carriers. If the availability of all these is ensured, that would help okay, in the energy transition. But the way in which these are going to be put into practice would differ in the two countries. 
China is much better endowed in hydro power. China also has established good capability for solar power installations, right? Now, after President Xi announced plans for peak carbon emission by 2030 and net zero by 2060, several groups began working on likely targets for the different energy sources in China. Broadly speaking, they suggest 15,000 billion units overall generation. That means 15,000 units per person, effectively, with the share of the four major sources like solar, wind, nuclear, idle, accounting for about 20%, accounting for 80%, and around 20% supplemented by biomass and fossil fuels. And also the rest supported by CCUS, that is carbon capture and storage and sequestration. Now, if you look at the estimates for India's energy transition plan by not net zero even up to 2050, you find that the estimates vary from 5,000 billion units to 15,000 billion units. It is a wide range. At 15,000, of course, we reach almost the same as China's. But at 5,000, it is about still four times as much as the present energy use per capita. Right? Now, I must tell you that I'm expressing these figures in terms of the actual output of power in billions of units and not in terms of the installed capacity of a plant that is given in gigawatts because the two are quite different. It is useful to remember that a power plant does not always operate fully at full power throughout the year. So a plant of one gigawatt installed capacity would produce about two and a half billion units if the solar in India, it may be much less if it is in China. And a gigawatt installed capacity of wind power could produce three to four billion units. And if it's nuclear power, it can produce seven billion units. So when you talk about the total production as 5,000 billion units, uh, 14,000 million units. It also depends upon how it is going to be derived from these various sources. That will give you an idea about how much of these sources will be required. Right? And that is why I mentioned that uh, there could be a difference in the way both countries utilize these different sources. Right? Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, flowing into our next question, what do you think are the best uh, sources that uh, of renewable energy for India and China respectively, considering our own uh, geographical conditions and China? Right. I think it's again more or less the same in both countries, right? But as I said, it could differ in terms of the distribution. Take, for instance, China. A recent publication looked at high resolution data from a survey of the country. And its estimates are that there is a high potential in China for generation of 13,000 to 15,000 billion units a year from wind power. In fact, it looks as though it can entire it can harvest its entire requirement that was proposed for net zero year by wind power alone. But wind power in 2020 produced only 500 billion units. But this gives you an idea of the kind of transformation that they need to have in terms of building up 
wind mills in the country wind turbines in the country now if you look at solar power china's potential is about 3000 to 5000 billion units and actual production in 2020 was about 260 billion units look at the jump they need to achieve to be able to reach 3000 to 5000 billion units but one advantage they have small advantage in china is that there is a five hour difference between eastern most and western most areas in china this means the availability of solar power can be stretched to that extent it's not just eight hours as in most of the other countries it can be a little more that is an advantage but the solar irradiance in china seems to be quarter of that in india so more area must be covered for harvesting the same power so while you can estimate the requirements from the various sources how you reach that goal and how you plan for it they are of course different for the different sources in china and also in india but china is not really satisfied with just this it is exploring geothermal source potential which is good more for heating and cooling purposes not so much for power generation potential now exploitation is of course relatively more expensive than hydro if it is going to be for power generation actually they are doing a great deal of exploration in tibet and xinjiang right and these reports have been published these are the re- these are recent reports i think they have taken up this geothermal source potential study a little more recently now in india solar power potential is estimated at 750 gigawatts which can provide about 1800 billion units this is the estimation of the national institute of solar energy it assumes 3% of waste land is used for solar power generation of course if you double the availability of waste land you double the solar energy solar power potential so that is the case that is availability of land is also an important factor now let us come to nuclear power that is very inevitable for both countries for two reasons the technological capability is well established more or less equally well in both countries and there is high degree of accumulated experience for many years there are though there are some differences between india and china i think in certain respects india is considered to be a little ahead but in certain respects china is ahead now the more important consideration is that nuclear power plants require very little of the critical materials like lithium and other rees besides once they are built they have a life of 50 to 60 years and operate for 80 to 90% of the time in the year whereas the life of solar and wind power plants is only half of that of nuclear power plants this calls for a capital expenditure investment once again somewhere half way down before you reach net zero for the renewal of the solar and wind power plants but i must also tell you that initial investment for nuclear power is high but because of its long life i think after the first two decades it can pay you back handsomely right for the rest of the life there are of course other difficulties both countries face neither country has adequate uranium and they depend on imports but i must also tell you that china has the capacity to build 
as many as 10 reactors at a time and commission them in five to six years, which means that their requirement for uranium will be faster if they build at such rates. India is, of course, not as fast as China's. But in any case, I think we need to look out for uranium from external sources. There are other solutions possible, which is that you recycle the spent fuel from the existing operating reactors, extract the residual nuclear fuel from it, which will also include plutonium, and then reuse it in new reactors or even the same reactor. And over a period of time, extend it to use of thorium. This is a program that was envisaged in 1950s by H.J. Baba in India. The Chinese have woken up to it now. And since about 30 years, they are also looking at it seriously. They are trying to build reactors for these purposes. Now, we must look at another important impediment that nuclear power could face, which is that public acceptance has to be one regarding nuclear waste. This becomes particularly important as scholars cite the need for the current fleet of nuclear power plants to go several fold within a few decades. China is also facing public resistance. In fact, they had uh, proposed to build reactors at certain sites. Now they have most of the power plants on the coastal sites where cooling water is available, so water is being used. But inland sites they had proposed, but because of the objections, they cancelled them. Now, in India, we have had these pro protests, but somehow we have managed to carry on to continue with the project and build it. This happened in Kurnagulam. This happened in the very first case in Narora. Okay. And it this happened also in Pakrapa. So we do face public resistance, but somehow or other, I think because of democracy, perhaps we are able to overcome that. China does not have this advantage. So while these various resources are available, except for perhaps your thermal source, which I don't think India has either explored or even if they explore, they would find much of a possibility. So that is where it stands in respect of the possible sources that would help us reduce our energy, you know, uh, carbon emissions, right? I'll stop there. Thank you, sir. That was a very comprehensive answer. Um, to follow up on that, uh, so a lot of these projects, like you mentioned, uh, how much China has to upscale in terms of turbines, in terms of so solar panels, and also other kinds of energy like nuclear. Um, so evictions and resettlements can often be high in these cases, particularly hydropower as well in countries like ours where the population is so high. So do you feel that large scale projects are still the way to go? Or do you feel there can be some uh, other kind of small scale projects that we could be focusing on that will maybe make, like uh, reduce or minimize the kind of evictions that uh, we can uh, foresee for the future? Right. I think uh, this is an important question. But uh, I must point out that uh, the social costs in terms of eviction and resettlements that you mentioned are essentially associated with large dams. China today tops the world in building dams. Tens of thousands of dams have been built small and large. Small dams, of course, do not require so much of evictions. With total of 370 gigawatts of hydropower, 
China tops the world. It produced 1300 billion units in 2020. You remember the Three Gorges Dam. It produces about 100 billion units in a year. China does have plans to build more ideal projects, but there are not too many sites for it. The one that they are now looking at is on the river Ryarlung Tsangpo in Tibet, close to our border. They are planning to build a fairly large dam there and an associated idle power project which can produce about 60 gigawatts, right? That could probably be about 200 to 300 million units, not much more. They have already begun tunneling work in the mountain with German machines. And reports say it has not been easy. Beyond this one, China has no scope for massive additions of dams elsewhere within its own geographical territory. So it's building in Southeast Asia. Right? So Although evictions and resettlements are not the only issues in relation to dam building, dam failures are not uncommon. You can build the dam, but if it has not been built to the required safety requirements, or if there have been problems because of the location where the dam was built, that's developed, that could be dam failure and huge fatalities. Of course, constant monitoring can certainly prevent and you can have perhaps remedial actions taken before any accident occurs. I don't think many people would know in China even, that in 1975, heavy winds and rainfall caused the failure of a dam, a large dam, and in those days, that was a very large one. In a place called Manchiao, because of the heavy rains and also winds, it triggered also the failure of a few other dams downstream. The few dams upstream, they failed, and they added the inflow into this dam. And this dam failed, and therefore there was a chain of failures. 26,000 people died. Mind you, in those days, in 1975, power was still power. The party was even more secretive than it is today. Very few people in China, in present-day China, even know about it. Today, of course, the situation is very different. If there is any accident anywhere, if there are any indications, I think the public would immediately come to know. So, dam failures considered as that much to be feared in these days. But your concern is right. In other countries, take our own country for instance, dam failures have occurred and resulted in large casualties. So it may not perhaps be a problem for China, but it is as of now the problem for India, partly because of our own tendency to keep building more of dams, more of idle power, because it helps us to reduce our carbon emissions and also to provide power for areas which are far away from our power stations here. So rather than building power lines to connect with those areas, we are trying to build dams there. Maybe that is something that we must reconsider. Right? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's exactly what I had in mind uh, for this question. Um, 
So I wanted to ask in terms of solar energy, how do you think that it's faring in India and China? Because solar energy has uh, in, you know, emerged as one of the most popular options globally. So do you feel that there is uh, uptake and is there, uh, are we able to translate the energy into the grid uh, to satisfy domestic demand? And what are the challenges in doing this? You know, in 2020, China could produce about 260 billion units of solar power. Attainment of solar power has come down even by 2020 to about 2 to 3 percent. This is because of several steps the government had taken. One of them is to link them with the load centers. The other is that many of the solar power plants built out of these 261 billion units are in provinces which are already industrialized. So they are building their own solar power plants. So they are able to use them along with the other modes of power generation, like coal or nuclear. Even in the case of wind power, curtailment was as high as 73% in 2016. It has come down to 3% in 2020. One other aspect that you must consider is that solar power production in China includes distributed solar and rooftop solar. But now China is going in more for rooftop solar, especially in regions on the coastline close to Taiwan. Because they have this other worry that if there is some disruption and power is not available from the power stations, if you have rooftop solar, at least you will be able to continue operations in those buildings. I think I have heard reports that Xi Jinping has recently, last month or so, ordered that all government buildings must have solar power on their roof. So they are also looking at security aspects, apart from containment aspects. Right? Okay, that is with respect to actual use of whatever energy is produced by solar or wind. But in terms of how quickly they are able to build these solar plants and wind turbines, China's advantage is that it is the world's leading producer of solar panels. It has invested on linking solar power to both sectors with a grid network, as I said. It is also producing massive wind turbines for offshore installations because they have the same problem about land availability or suitability. While I mentioned about the survey that was conducted some time ago, high resolution land survey. And they came up with a very high level of wind power generation. I don't know whether what you see from the sky actually is suitable when you come down to the ground level. Anyway, I think China is able to build if required wind turbines everywhere and also turbines in offshore installations. Where you have the problem of locating the foundations for the turbines offshore, and you have to carry power from there to lines laid under water in the sea. And then, of course, people who question the amount of carbon emission involved in you know people traveling to and from. The offshore turbines. There are a few kilometers 
away from the show. Of course, they may not be very much, but still, I think those who are well, carbon efficient are free eggs, they would like to provide some kind of objection to every bit of carbon emission, wherever it occurs. Anyway, I think in some, China is well equipped to build solar power, wind power, and make use of it. If you ask me the same question about India, I think in both cases we are much slower. We have become aware of what is required to be done. Something is being done. Large solar power parks are being built. Actually, they are also being used to store energy in batteries. So that when required to support the grid, you can make use of these battery stored energy, right? And this is energy from non carbon emitting sources. So that is very welcome. So these are plans that. India is making, China is also making. China looks at the batteries in a different way. Maybe it will come to it a little later. Right. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, sir. That was a very comprehensive answer. So I wanted to ask uh, we discussed a lot about um, electronic vehicles, uh, carbon sequestration, and hydrogen as carrier. So what kind of technology do you think would be really critical in um, assisting with the just transition, just energy transition for India and China? Now, clearly carbon capture, utilization and sequestration is a key technology. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, China still depend upon some amount of Coal power, or of course, fossil fuel power, maybe coal or oil or gas. They would prefer oil and gas because they produce less of carbon dioxide than coal. So they, anyway, would be dependent on fossil fuels even when they reach the net zero stage. So carbon capture utilization technology is important. Now, whether you are going to utilize it or sequestrate it, that is the key part. Although carbon capture itself is not that simple. If you are looking at the source of carbon as from power stations, then it's difficult to capture them because once they come out, they disperse. Right? Once they come out of the huge structure that they have, right? I think it's difficult to capture. And also, they have a certain amount of heat. There are chemical procedures for it. And then the flue gas that comes out of power station will also carry a lot of particles, not just carbon dioxide. On the other hand, in a chemical plant or an industrial plant, you get purer carbon dioxide, a local source, which can easily be captured. And there are techniques that have been developed for this. So while it is possible to do carbon capture in sources like industrial plants, it's not that easy for thermal power plants. And if all they are industrial power plants, maybe they can have another industry to use the carbon that has been produced and separated. But in terms of power plants, they are located in different places. It may not be possible for you to have adjacent chemical plants for various reasons. Now, even if electricity generation in a country can substantially eliminate emissions, there are other sectors that still depend on fossil fuels, like, for instance, shipping and air transport, for instance. 
in these cases, there is no way of using carbon capture because they are moving sources. And so I think we may not be able to account for it, but so far there is no attempt to even quantify it. Okay. Now, there have been a few studies in carbon capture and sequestration possibilities in India, but no detailed work is needed. Although in China, they have identified locations where they could store this captured carbon. Now, again, the questions arise, how safe it would be, this storage, and for how long periods of time? Whether in the process of storage, there could be leakage which comes out, or whether some disruption in the rock structure is likely to release them at some point of time. So these are, of course, studied more by way of precaution. But uh, in any case, I think we have not reached a stage of massive carbon capture and sequestration capabilities. Of course, the markets which are developing these, they claim that on a small scale, on millions of tons of scale, it is possible. But what we are looking for is billions of tons of carbon capture and sequestration. So I think these uh, options of carbon capture and sequestration is a little dicey. I don't think we'll be able to even assume that it's likely to happen over the next decade or two decades, and then you require, according to IEPCC's emissions, to be prepared even that early. So, but of course, experiments will continue. Maybe at one point of time, you will come up with a good solution. In talking about solution, I might like this a bit here, but I would like also to point out that it is a saying that yesterday's solutions are today's problems, and today's solutions could be tomorrow's problems. I think this is something that we should not really forget. Okay. Now, apart from carbon capture, which is possible if you are talking about carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas emission, what do you do for methane, which is also a greenhouse gas emission? Methane emission used to come from coal mines. That has been the main concern so far. But there was no way of capturing that. There was even no way of accounting that. With closure of the mines, as would happen then, you know, we move on to carbon free sources of power. I think. One will turn to rice fields and cattle and pig farms as of that meeting. Uh, the rice fields and cattle have caught the Western eye. And they are trying to blame India, saying that, oh, you have so much of rice being produced, you have so much of cattle, and so you must bring down the carbon emission. I think this would be the case if we bring down the emission due to power generation, they will still be talking about rice fields and cattle. Anyway, that's a different thing. But mercifully, I think methane production from cattle farms is estimated to be on a much less scale. So I think I'll stop there. Maybe I've given, I've wandered a bit in answering your question. No, sir, it was our pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so for the next question, um, how can the government encourage research and development towards climate sensitive research in India and China? We've discussed a lot about carbon sequestration and things like that. So how do you think we should direct our funds? I think it's obvious from what I had said earlier. 
carbon capture utilization and sequestration is a technology we must pursue okay primarily because it's a distant technology but it will be required so even earlier and will continue to require and continue to be required at later times so if it is available it will be certainly approved besides i think i would talk about fuel cells batteries also hydrogen production which we have not touched so far we have also not touched transportation now if you are going to have high technologies in 3d printing for manufacturing i think you need robotics the robotics and 3d printing for manufacturing and assembly of components for those equipments that you require for energy production or storage if you want to have for instance nuclear power plants a smaller size built in a factory brought to a site and erected there to reduce the time required for construction maybe you have to go for robotics even 3d printing by the way when you talk about 3d printing i must tell you that china is now trying to build a dam with 3d printing This is a small dam, of course, near a reservoir, which was essentially a dam for storage of water. We are going to build a dam essentially by 3D printing. That is concrete is poured in layers, one upon another, by robotics and 3D printing machines. i think this may also become essential at some time but the more important one in the near future will be storage batteries which could be produced in quicker time recycled also okay in quick time i think these are activities which can be done by robotics better than human beings for the safety of human beings and also for the quick actions that robotics can take and i think as you proceed with the technologies for low carbon emission there are requirements that warrant attention to other technologies like robotics and grid mapping if you are looking ahead you must also pay attention to this i think i'll stop there again i think i have a tendency to wander perhaps anyway i hope you are satisfied with the answers no so i am very satisfied with the answers this is exactly what i was hoping for a long form kind of interview okay anything else yes sir one second Uh, i had two last questions we mentioned a lot about transport as well so uh, how do you think transport can be a bit more sustainable in india and china well as in most of these cases china has gone far ahead of us right china's infrastructure drive has had one good result although it has not been good in terms of building up on structures right national highways high speed railway lines build them in big time and they have they may have copied but they have done it on their own after they have understood the design from the originals these provide quick and more efficient connectivity 
their highways are much better than our highways, at least on the pictures I see. High speed railway lines were built at great cost, but today passenger traffic is very low, not profitable. But I'm sure it will pick up, pick up soon. The context of decarbonization is the roadways to be addressed where the railways can run on electric power from overhead lights. <coughs> Road vehicles, especially light medium vehicles, can run on batteries. China has acquired a leading position in manufacture of batteries for what they call new energy vehicles. China is now strong enough to pose a threat to others to predict repricing of its exports. India has nowhere there now. It's trying to get there now. Maybe they will get there due to course. Now, according to India's Ministry of Roads and Highways, there were about 330 registered vehicles on the road in India as of March 2020. Of this, 75% were two wheelers. So we need to find batteries for all these. And also for light and medium cars. And we need to have electric power to run them. An EDF report says a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack is good for 240 kilometers ride by a car. That works out to about one kilowatt hour for six kilometers. For the 80 million cars that the ministry says we have registered now, if every one of them runs just 10 kilometers a day, so that is a, a supposition that is rather perhaps not quite true because not every one of them will be on the road. Even so, annual power requirement would be about 50 billion units. That can be managed. If ever we get to that stage, all of them being done, that is. For the 250 million two wheelers, we know the battery capacity may be low, but the two wheelers are perhaps running longer per day. The power needed would be perhaps 360 billion units per year. That's one estimate. That too perhaps can be managed. But what is required is easy provisions for charging these vehicles, whether at home or on the road, and work out the cost of charging. Whether you are going to charge it on the basis of uh, so-called low-cost renewable power, I don't think we can speak any more about low cost power for renewables because I think the connection to the grid must also be considered the cost of connection to the grid. Anyway, that is what people are saying now. But whatever it is, I think we need to look at these aspects about charging these vehicles and also perhaps the cost of charging. China has done a great deal of work on providing charging locations and is working on the cost of it. So I think we still have a long way to go as in many other instances, but this is something that we have to do if we are committed to reducing our emissions. Right? Yes. That is that that is where I would stop. Thank you very much, sir. So for my final question, uh, I wanted to just ask a clarification, actually. Uh, China had a lot more natural reserves of coal, right? So a lot of their industrialization, everything was highly dependent on coal. Uh, does that, uh, for some reason, maybe put India at an advantage to be able to decarbonize faster because we don't have such a natural reserve? Or is that not the case? If it's not the case, could you perhaps say why that's not the case? Look, I think both countries have been excessively dependent on 
school as such. Right? China has actually started shutting down and many mines have already closed. So they have begun to face problems of job losses. They are trying to tackle it. We have not done that yet. We will be very soon facing that. Right? Now, that's a more British problem for us because in a democracy, the public has a voice and the politicians have to listen to them. But in China, they don't have to. The party doesn't have to listen to them. Okay? So this is going to be a serious matter. China has already shut down a lot of points. India also has shut down quite a few mines, but not as much. But in the in proportion of the actual coal mines, existing coal mines, we will soon have to reach the same level as China. And our it about all depends upon how much of coal power you think you still require later. See, like China, we don't have oil, we don't have gas. China has a certain amount of gas. China has a certain amount of oil. It may not be sufficient for present day purposes, but when they have shifted to renewable powers, maybe the requirement will be less. They might still be able to manage on their own. In fact, China today is the largest gas producer by, you know, fracture process, right? That's of course a very highly polluting process. But China will want to be self-sufficient. So they have taken it up. At one time, the US was the largest producer okay, for fracking. But China is now. So we don't have that advantage of indigenous sources of oil and gas. So that's something that we have to look at and prepare for. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for doing this uh, interview. It was very fruitful to have this conversation with you. Um, I'll be attaching sir's bio and a bit of his work in the section below the video. So any of you interested can please check it out. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For yes, sir. I'll just stop the recording. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care.